pray that I might speak to you this morning in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Over the past couple of weeks, our news feeds on social media and the headlines that we have seen on television um, have been bombarding us with image after image of the complete and utter destruction that has been caused by Hurricane Dorian, particularly in the Bahamas. The people there have lived through what can only be described as a 36-hour horror movie, a nightmare that felt like it really was never going to end. And as the water rose and roofs were ripped off houses, people there had to flee from room to room trying to find shelter, trying to find anything that they could cling to, desperately trying to keep their heads above the rising waters. And when the winds finally died down, and when the rain began to stop, and the waves stopped crashing against the shore, and Hurricane Dorian began to set her sights on her next target. Slowly, people began to come out of what was left of their homes. Slowly, they began to lift their heads and look around. And what they saw, what we have seen, was complete and utter devastation. Countless homes destroyed, loved ones missing. The airport was completely underwater, making, making it so that there was no way that rescue planes or relief planes could get in, or that injured people could get out. How could the people living through that nightmare how could they not be feeling like their reality is completely hopeless? Now I want to switch gears for a second. Back in the spring, many of us gathered at our sister congregation of St. Albans for their last service. The bishop was present with us to deconsecrate that space and the doors were closed, bringing to an end 60 years of faithful worship, service, and fellowship in that place. And we all know, those of us who have been around the church for a while, we all know that St. Albans is not alone in suffering that thing. In recent years, we have witnessed in our own diocese and across the country, church after church closing its doors for the last time. <clears throat> we have experienced declining numbers in many of our churches. The number of funerals that are done in a year far outweigh the number of, number of baptisms that get celebrated. Sunday school teachers are often ready to go on a Sunday morning with no children to teach. And on that point, what I want to say this morning is I know that we have a sprinkling of, of younger children and infants with us this morning. I want to say to you, thanks be to God that you're here. I want to say to you that here at St. Jude's, children and youth absolutely and utterly needs to be a priority for us as we enter this fall season. We need to discern how we are going to proclaim the good news of the gospel to the youngest members of this community and the wider community. And so much work needs to be done in that regard, but we are faithful to trying to do that. But the fact remains that for many years now, Sometimes it feels like when it comes to the church, sometimes it feels like we 
are on a sinking ship. And it's hard not to lose hope. It is really hard sometimes not to lose hope. And sometimes we find ourselves falling into despair. And the same thing happens in our personal lives too. Because sometimes storms come up in our lives. Whether it be an illness or the breakdown of a relationship or having to live through a tragedy of some kind in your life, the fact is we all know that it will inevitably reign in our lives. And sometimes when it does, sometimes when it rains in our lives, we, we hunger down just like the people in the Bahamas were doing. We hunger down and we try with all of our might to weather whatever storm happens to be raging. Wondering if that nightmare that we find ourselves in is ever going to end. And then when the wind dies down for a moment, and we get a chance to look around, and we see the damage that has been done, where we see that our, where our lives have ended up, and we don't know how we can possibly begin to put the pieces back together again. Sometimes we feel like the situations that we find ourselves living in are completely hopeless. I think the image that gets used in that scripture reading from Jeremiah that we just heard, I think the image of the potter and the clay, I think it speaks to those moments of our lives where we are feeling hopeless. Jeremiah was called by God. God called Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house. And when he got there, he found the potter working at his wheel. But whatever the potter was working on, whatever creation the potter was working on was spoiled in his hands. And rather than throwing out the clay, rather than throwing out the clay and starting over with new clay, Jeremiah looked on as the potter reworked that clay into another good vessel, one that was pleasing to the potter. If you know anything about sitting at a potter's wheel, and I don't, if you know anything about sitting at a potter's wheel, if you have ever dabbed in pottery, then apparently there are a number of things that could cause the potter's work to spoil in the potter's hand. If the potter doesn't spend time centering the clay, it will be wobbly and misshapen. If the potter doesn't use the right amount of sponge, it will affect her ability to shape her work. There are many factors that could cause the vessel that the potter is working on to spoil. But what does a true and good potter do? when things don't turn out the way that they intend. She begins again. She recenters the clay. She runs her hands across it with perfect pressure. She uses the right amount of sponge. She reworks the clay into something that seems good to her. I want you to think about a question this morning. What is your hope rooted in? Is your hope, is it rooted in the circumstances of your life? Is your hope rooted and grounded in achieving the picture you have in your mind of what the shape of the clay vessel of your life should look like? Because if it is, if your hope is 
centered in your life unfolding as you think it should? If it is, when everything is going well in your life and the sun is shining and everything is as you think it should be, that's when it is easy for you to hold on to hope. But on the other side of that coin, if the source of your hope is rooted in the circumstances of your life, of things going as you think they should, if it's connected to what happens to you, regardless of whether those things are within your control or not, if your hope is centered in a sense of life unfolding as you think it should, then the moment something happens in your life that causes the clay of your life to spoil, the moment you find, find yourself thinking, this isn't what my life was supposed to look like, the moment you most need to be able to cling to your hope is the moment that it is going to elude you. If hope for you is rooted in the circumstances, then when the storms come up in life, hope is likely nowhere to be found. Christian hope is not rooted in the circumstances of our lives. Christian hope is rooted and grounded in our maker, in our potter, in the one who formed us in our mother's womb, in the one who loved us so much that he sent Jesus so, to us so that we might know the heart of our maker. What does a true and good potter do when the vessel spoils? When bad things happen in our lives, when we lose our way, when tragedy strikes, what does a true and good potter do? She begins again. She recenters the clay. She runs her hand across it with perfect presser, pressure. She, she uses just the right amount of sponge. She reworks it into something that seems good to her. When a potter is at the wheel, there is always hope. There is always opportunity. Even if it spoils in her hands, there is always the ability to be remade into something new. Real, life-giving hope is putting your trust in the belief that God really is the potter of this world. That God really is the potter of our lives. And that God is constantly at the potter's wheel, shaping and reshaping our lives and the world into something new. Into something that is pleasing to God. And the really great thing, the really great thing is God invites us, each one of us as followers of Jesus, God invites us to put our hands to the wheel, to participate, and to share in the work of bringing this hope and this new life to the world that often spoils. God invites us to share in the work of shaping and reshaping the world around us. The images that we have been seeing in the Bahamas paint a picture of what many are feeling is a completely hopeless situation. But God is present in the midst of that. God is at the potter's wheel. And God is inviting us to partner with God to breathe hope and to shine light and life into this tragedy. I was listening to a segment on CBC Radio the other night. And they were talking again about how it was impossible to get the rescue and relief planes in to help because the airport was underwater. But the story was about this local man who had a jet ski. And for over 24 hours, he had been out on his jet ski, going from house to house, rescuing people who were trapped and bringing them safely to dry land. The potter is at her wheel through acts of love such as this. The Primate World Relief and Development Fund is accepting donations to support relief efforts in the Bahamas. Again, through the generosity of people who give, 
the potter is at her wheel, making love known in the midst of this tragedy. I was on holidays this summer when the gas explosion happened in Old East Village here in London. But again, the potter has definitely been at the wheel, working through all of the firefighters and first responders, through the generosity of the community who have come together to support and to respond to the various needs that come up. The potter will reshape the clay and breathe new life into it. There's no denying that any time a church community has to close, there is a lot of grief. There is a lot of sadness that goes along with that. And it was certainly no different for our brothers and sisters at St. Albans. But today, today as we gather in this place, we are celebrating. We are giving thanks to God that our potter is at the wheel forming us the clay, calling us into something new and exciting and inviting us to share in that work. We don't know what that will yet look like in its entirety, but we can see the signs of this new creation all around us in the continuation of the breakfast program here at St. Jude's, in our ongoing commitment to our working together to reach out to others with God's love, in the fellowship and the friendships that we are starting to form with each other in this place. Our hope, our hope does not lie in the circumstances that led to the closing of St. Albans. Our hope lies in God, our potter, who is shaping us into something new. And the same is true in your own lives. Even if your life doesn't or hasn't gone in the direction you think it should, your God is still at the wheel. No matter how misshapen your life or this world might seem, sometimes God is not finished with you yet. Your life, this world, and the future are in the ones of the one who invited Jeremiah and invites you today to abide in hope in the work of his hands. God is the pot. We are the clay. And therein lies our hope. Thanks be to God.